John 1, 1 through 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, and to those of you watching online, good morning. Um, my name is Josh, in case you don't know me. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, we have, uh, we've, been in the, we've been taking a break from Mark uh, for Christmas, which is kind of what a lot of us, that's our usual experience if you've been in the church for any length of time. Uh, you take a break from whatever it is you're doing, and then you set aside time to, uh, around the Christmas season to go through the various Christmas stories or do something that has to do with Christmas. It's like you, you, you have to do it. You're almost forced into it, whether you want to do it or not. And everyone expects it. Everybody expects this is what you're going to do. So uh, the real, the real uh, dilemma is how can you keep people's brains from switching off because they already know what's, what's going to happen. And so we decided we would have this series with a really creative, catchy title called Advent 2021 uh, to help you not uh, switch your brains off. Uh, no, that's, that's just a joke. But um, what we wanted to do, and of course this has been kind of like jumbled because Cameron and his family got COVID, so the, the order of the series kind of got messed up. But we wanted to look at the different Gospels and kind of see how is Christmas portrayed in the various Gospels. And I, fool that I am, or glutton for punishment that I am, I was like, hey, I want to do John. And for those of you who are familiar, you'd be like, is there, is there a Christmas story in John? I didn't know there was a Christmas story in John. Well, there might not be, actually. <laughs> I could just be making this up. Uh, but yeah, if you are familiar, um, in John, there's no Mary and Joseph. There's no angels appearing. There's no shepherds in the night. There's no Magi or Herod. There isn't any of that stuff that you usually think of when you think of Christmas. No baby in the manger and the cattle are lowing and all that sort of thing. That's just not, that's not John's paradigm. So the question, a good question to ask would be, why does John not do any of that? You know, why, why wouldn't he do that? Um, it's a good question. And I'm, I'm going to try and use the board here. This is two weeks in a row. We are, uh, you know, I, I talk to people who, who, have, uh, who are new here. And probably eight out of ten times they'll say something like, oh, yeah, I saw a video of Tim Mackey. And so that's how I heard about this church. And uh, so I didn't want to do the board thing because then it's like, oh, this is, you're just trying to be Tim Mackey. But, but, you're, but you're like the JV version of Tim Mackey. Uh, but Cameron broke the barrier. So now I'm like, it's, all, it's on. It's on. We can do it now. Uh, so Tim... You are the master. I'm not trying to compete, okay? Uh, but I did want to use the board here. So John, back to, back to John. Okay, John is aware of the other Gospels. He's aware of the stories. Those stories have already been told. Matthew and Luke especially. All those stories, he's aware of those. And he's aware that, um, that those stories are, are largely compiled to give a history to the running up of Jesus because he is the one that was prophesied about. He is the one that people were expecting. That's what those stories were trying to show you, is that, hey, these promises way back here that God made to Israel, they are being fulfilled here in your midst through the birth of Jesus. And so John is actually zooming out of that, um, I guess you'd say, Judaic framework a bit, and he's, he's going broadly like all humanity, the entire world. What is Jesus to people who don't know about any promises, who don't know God, who don't know that he said that he would come. Um, what, is, what is Jesus to them? That's largely, I think, why John 
wrote this. Now, of course, of course, this is uh, this account is so full of Jewishness. It's hard to miss. You know, he says, in the beginning, of course, that's, that's from Genesis. He talks about Jesus being life, and in the garden you had the tree of life, and God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, and he became a living being, and uh, he's called the Word, and God created through his Word, saying, let there be light. Oh, and by the way, he's the, the light of men. You know, so there's, there's plenty to connect this account to what the Jews would think of. But this idea of the word, or logos it is in the Greek, and people debate on how you, how you pronounce it, and one of the reasons for that is because there's this guy named Erasmus um, back in the, in, around the Reformation period, and he said, you know, it's really hard to learn, for students to learn Greek because they have a whole bunch of different vowel combinations that make the exact same pronunciated sound, so we're going to change the pronunciations to make it easier for you to learn. Um, if, you go to some, if you go to Greece or you talk to someone who knows Greek, they'll say, yeah, that's not how you say it. But we don't really know how, it, how they said it, so uh, you can debate about it. It doesn't really matter. But uh, so here, we have this word. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Low. Uh, that is not a G, is it? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I hope Tim isn't watching this. He would be totally ashamed. Uh, that's a Greek. G, uh, logos. Lost my train of thought there. Okay, so logos. Uh, it's translated word in English. One thing that you'll learn about both Cameron and I is not only are we uh, are we losing the battle with hair on the top of our heads, but we're both left-handed. So for those of you on this side, I'm I'm kind of sorry. I have to block I have to block what I'm doing a little bit. So uh, this this word logos. It's, uh, it's translated word. This is actually an interesting concept back in the, in the world that John is, is writing into. Uh, logos has to do with a sort of unifying um, principle of knowledge, principle of understanding. So I, I think the best way to explain it is to give an example. So out, here, out back here, uh, I live in the parsonage right here, by the way. Please don't throw, please don't TP it or anything like that. Uh, so there's a there's an English walnut tree out here, and it, it's uh, it's kind of annoying. And it's not annoying because it's a walnut tree. It's annoying because there are squirrels that know that there are walnuts in there, and these squirrels actually know at a certain time of year there will be walnuts up there. And what they do is they they get the walnuts while they're still in that green husk thing, and it's still it's still soft and and juicy. And they get up there and they, they gnaw all the pieces off and drop all those pieces all over whoever's parked their car there. And it leaves like this syrupy residue that's really difficult to get off. Why am I bringing this up? Well, the squirrel has a kind of knowledge. They know that there's a walnut in there. They know how to get to it. And so they go up there and they rip it off. So they have this, they have this little bit of knowledge. Let's, let's just call it like right there. That is... That is the knowledge of how to get the walnut out of the tree. But that part of their knowledge is actually a subset of a greater part of knowledge, which is how to get food generally, right? How to, how to get food generally. But then how to get food is actually a subset of a different category of knowledge, which is how to survive, survival instincts, right? So you have, you're getting into these bigger and bigger categories of knowledge. And this is, we're just talking about the nut right there. Outside of that survival instinct, this is just the squirrels. So outside of that, you might have, here's, here's a, a dog's knowledge of survival instinct and a, and a human or whatever. So you have these various things that are known, that people and things know. But even these are fitting inside of a, a much larger category of knowledge, which is all the uh, instinctual knowledge of everything, right? And then this category sits next to these other categories of like, oh, knowledge of architecture, knowledge of how the stars go around, uh, knowledge of your wife or spouse or whatever. Each one of us actually is one of these things. Knowing, knowing Josh Wilder is a subset of a much bigger subset of all, all there is to know, everything that there is to know. All knowledge comes in here. That's Logos. Logos is this big thing that everything else fits into. In English, it's how we get, you know, in your, if you went to college or you've noticed the titles for your college classes where they almost don't sound like English. 
Um, at the end, there's always this ology thing on it. Geology, biology, whatever ology it is. That's logos. That's where it comes from. So when you get into Bible college, they just talk about things like soteriology, and you're like, what in the world is that? Well, that's the doctrine of salvation. Well, why do you call it soteriology? Well, they're just getting back to the Greek and trying to make you sound smart, and which also kind of makes other people feel dumb. It's kind of crude, actually. So here's, here's what Logos is, and this is an experience that people knew. What, what John is, is doing is he's trying to appeal to two big things that people experience. The first one is Logos, knowledge. You know things, other things know things, and all that fits into this big thing called knowledge. And knowledge is important because when you know things, you can solve problems. You can get through life when you know things. If you don't know things, your life is going to be really hard for you, right? Okay, so the second thing that, uh, that he appeals to that's part of everyone's universal experience is this word here. Darkness. Everyone has experienced the dark. I just experienced this last night as my son is learning how to uh, sleep without mom and dad right, holding him the entire time. And I didn't know, we were, my wife and I were doing this thing like, hey, since uh, both of us don't sleep when, uh, when he wakes up, even if only one of us is trying to take care of him, maybe one of us could like, go in another room and actually sleep. And then, and then when this one who's working on him is like, I've had enough. And you, then you tag in, you know, and, and swap. So my wife and I did that last night, and I did not know that she had booby-trapped the room. She had moved things around, and it was dark, and I was half asleep, and so I was running over things. Darkness. We all know, we, we, we've experienced darkness. You don't know how to get around. You stub your toes. Uh, thankfully, I'd, I didn't have any serious problems um, when, I, uh, when I was stumbling around the darkness last night, but... Darkness takes on several forms. Here, if you're, a, if you're an avid note taker or you're like OCD, I can lay it out beforehand and then you can sort of have all the categories for it. So I'm going to put darkness in two categories. Here's one. It's uh, ignorance. In the second category, I would just call straight up evil. Now, there are, there's a whole bunch of different ways to categorize this. I'm just doing one. I'm not, I'm not pretending to be the expert on darkness or whatever. Um, but these seem like two major ways in which we experience darkness. So the first one, darkness as ignorance, is actually, uh, th there are two categories for this. Um, there's ignorance of the problem. Like, we, don't, we actually don't know what is wrong. We don't know what the problem is. We're ignorant of that. You know, this was uh, when, when uh, my wife and I, uh, back when we were still holding our son, instead of trying to get him to sleep without us holding him, we watched this movie called War of the Worlds. Have you guys seen that? And it's the more modern one. I think there was a really old one. It was the modern one with Tom Cruise. Uh, but anyways, in that movie, uh, they, think, they think there's just this storm happening. They think it's just a storm. And then Tom Cruise is like, well, how come the, how come the wind is blowing towards the storm? That's weird. And they actually don't know what's happening. They heard that something had gone on somewhere in Europe, like there was this big earthquake or something like that. They didn't really know what was happening and until like the lightning storm hits and then these big tripod things come out and these little vaporizers are like, and people like disappear in a puff of smoke. Nobody knows what's going on. So they're all running like crazy. Similar thing happened to us actually like a year and a half ago. Remember when COVID first hit? Well, it's not that similar, but remember when COVID first hit, there were the people who were like, this isn't really happening. You know, maybe some of you guys are like that. This isn't really happening. This is just fake news in the media to try and bring down Donald Trump, you know, on the one side. Or there, on the other side, there's people waiting in line at Costco to get every single roll of toilet paper they could possibly get. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't actually know what was going on. And that's a problem. That's part of, that's part of being in the dark. It's not knowing what's happening. Not knowing what the problem is. This is a problem in early medicine, where it wasn't really medicine. It was just kind of like, well, something's wrong, and you're probably going to die. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, so we don't know what the problem is. We don't know why you're dying. You're just dying. The second one is, um, is ignorance about a solution. Now this one, we are so familiar with, right? Uh, this is the cure is worse than the disease syndrome, right? And you, we, don't, we don't need to go you know, too far. If I go back to, to modern medicine, they were like, well, I think what's going on is your bile level and your saliva level and your blood level are imbalanced. 
So we're going to attach like these leeches and, uh, and eels and things to you to suck your blood out while we drain more out, and that'll, that'll fix it, right? Uh, the cure is worse than the, the disease. Uh, once again, not to, not to hammer on COVID too much, but I, fa- I found this story. I thought it was fascinating. Uh, the cure is worse than the disease. Okay, a man in Italy. Oh, by the way, so in, in this particular place of Italy, you have to have a vaccine card, proof of vaccination in order to go to work, right? So that, that's, once again, that's a solution that we're proposing to the COVID problem is make everybody get vaccinated. So uh, here's a guy, a man in Italy who wanted proof of vaccination but didn't want to get the shot, attempted to trick medical workers using a fake arm. <laughs> Nurse Filippa Bua, sorry Filippa if I'm saying that poorly, uh, in Biella, sorry uh, if you're in that town, um, said she first noticed something was amiss pretty quickly. She said that she first thought that he had an actual prosthetic arm and he had accidentally offered her the wrong one. But that was not the case. The man was wearing a covering on his torso with two rubber foam arms attached. So here's a, here's a solution, right? Ignorance of like an actual solution, by the way, they, they go on. The man ultimately admitted that his goal had been to obtain a COVID-19 vaccination certificate without receiving the shot. So he finally admitted, yeah, uh, probably wasn't the best solution, but it was, it was a shot in the dark, right? <laughs> Darkness. But, you know, things that, are, things that are less, you know, perhaps less humorous, um, homelessness is a huge problem. All up and down the West Coast. And... Uh, here in Portland, there have been things proposed like, hey, what we need to do is just build like a, a really big apartment structure because the real problem is that people need a safe place to live in. The trouble is that they did, already did that in Seattle and L.A., and what happened is the strongest and the, the most keen-minded just became thugs and gangs and sort of guarded the door and only let people in if they paid, you know, it just became a huge fiasco. So once again, cure is worse than the disease. We actually don't know. Here's another one a little closer to home, another story I came across. A number of Portland Police Bureau, or the number of Portland Police Bureau sworn members is the fewest it's been since 1989. Police staffing numbers in Portland have dwindled since the movement to defund the police in the wake of George Floyd's murder. So here's a solution to the problem of systemic racism. We'll defund the police. Now, as the union is calling on city officials to double the police force, Mayor Ted Wheeler and city councilors are left deciding what to do to ensure the city works for everyone again. As of November 8th, Portland police had recorded 77 homicides so far in 2021. That's the highest number ever recorded in the city. We don't know, we are ignorant, what the solution is. What we do is we have these trade-offs. We call them solutions, but they're really trade-offs, right? I've just given you several examples of how, how, we, trade, how we trade things off. This, we suffer in darkness because of our ignorance. We actually don't know what to do. We don't know the problem, and we don't know what to do about it. Okay, enough on that. I think I've, I hope I've carried the point. Darkness as evil. Okay, so here's the deal. Even if... We knew what the problem was and what the solution was. We still have this darkness problem, right? We still have the problem of evil. Enlightenment will not be enough. Because, you know what, we're already... We're already set against... We're already set against others. You know, we're competing for resources. You know the reason why? You know the reason why it's so annoying about those squirrels in that tree? It's because there's like five of them that are competing for all those walnuts, and so they're getting as many out as they possibly can to stuff them somewhere so no one else can get them. I know, because I saw them digging in the blueberry bush to get them out. We're against others. We want me first. And that's a problem. I just mentioned a few... A few uh, problems in which this is the case. You have the solution for homelessness, but there's e- there, I want my resources, and you've got them. You're in the way of me getting my resources, so I'm going to bar the door. You've got to pay me whatever to get, into, to get into this building. 
You see it in what I mentioned earlier, the toilet paper hoarding. I gotta, get, I gotta make sure me and my family get all of our toilet paper. I don't care if nobody else gets theirs. Or maybe, maybe a little bit closer to home. We all know that much of the, much of the goods we buy come from places in the world where people are oppressed and not treated fairly in order to get us those goods at the right price. Now, this is a huge problem. I'm, I'm not trying to solve that problem. <laughs> I'm just saying it's, it's part of the problem. These are mixed together. These two are mixed together. You cannot divorce them from one another. Not only that, uh, oh, here, here's one more example. I, I don't want to miss this one. So, um, social media started, started being a thing years back, right? Mm. Whoa. That thing works really well. <laughs> oh, my. I just burned my tongue. Ouch. Uh, where was I going? Oh, yeah. Um, so, we now know about social media in terms of like, what it does to people's brains, especially to young people. We know, and we know it's bad. And the people who invented these things, they know it's bad too, and that's why they keep their kids out of it. But their solution to like, oh, we have this bad thing is, well, we'll just take away the thumbs down button. Oh, well, that'll fix it, right? We're set against other people. As long as I can profit off another person, I'm gonna do it. Even if it's bad, I won't stop doing the bad thing. I'll just, you know, do something that makes it feel a little less bad. Okay, second thing. I'm just going to do this so I don't have to rise much. So, against ourselves, that's another thing. We act against ourselves. You guys realize that? I mean, I'm not ignorant of the fact that Oreos are not good for me and that they will make me fat. It does not stop me from eating them. I'm also not ignorant of the fact that kale and broccoli are good for me, which is why I eat them, even though I do not like them. And people say, oh, you know what? You know what will make you like kale? Here's what you do. You get some, drizzle some olive oil over it, put it in a pan, put it in the oven. And I go, okay, well, that's what you're describing is frying something. I like fried things. Okay? But that, that's, you're, you're kind of taken away from the kale part of it by covering that up with the whole fried sensation. We know what's good for us, and we don't do it. Plain and simple. I know I shouldn't yell at my kids. I know I shouldn't be impatient with a four-month-old. And yet I find myself impatient with them. Actually, constitutionally incapable of stopping ourselves from hurting ourselves and other people. Here's another little factoid for you. I found out in 2020, I'm reading from a quote, in 2020, Numbers of drug overdoses hit an all-time high. In Oregon, particularly, in Oregon, Oregon witnessed a 40% death spike with 580 fatalities because of illicit chemicals. We don't like ourselves. Suicide has been on the rise. It's been up 35% from 15 years ago. Live in darkness. Darkness and evil. By the way, that's 580 families of loved people. To add to the other 77 homicides this year, people who loved them who are going to have a Christmas without someone they love. Darkness. Finally, uh, sorry, I'm standing right in front of this. The cameras aren't going to see anything. For those of you online, we're set against God. We've got our hearts set against God. We don't want other people telling us what to do. We want world peace. We want to get along with other people. And the reason why we want to get along with other people, very often, is not because we have this uh, deep, compassion, abiding love for that other person, but because we want to be able to get on with whatever it is in our life. You know, someone's making noise, the, squeezy, the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Well, just give them the oil so I can get back to my life. You know, we've, we prefer peace because then we are free to do whatever we would like, to follow our appetites into eating <laughs> Oreos and whatever else, you know. And I'm kind of I'm body slamming us, right? I'm, just, I'm, kinda, I'm trying to hammer this point home that we, 
I'm trying to tell you, the world is dark, in case you guys haven't noticed, okay? We do live in a dark and violent world, and because we live here, largely insulated, we can often forget it. And the world Jesus was born into was even more dark and violent than our own. Okay? So I'm trying to paint this picture here. Here, here are a few other verses here in John. We stopped at, uh, at verse 9. The true light which enlightens everyone is coming into the world. Well, the next verse says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. We have a serious problem here. It says further here in, in chapter 3, verse uh, 19. Jesus says, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Sometimes we play patty cake with darkness. We're okay with it because we know we're not okay and we're afraid if we bring that part of us that isn't okay into the light, that will be too painful. So we like darkness. We actually like it. One more here in John. Later on, Jesus, in this story that this is coming from, Jesus had done all of his miracles and some people had believed and some people hadn't. John says this, chapter 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Ouch. We live in darkness because we want the, someone's glory other than God's. We live against God because we want our own glory. Okay, I hope that's dark and bleak enough uh, because the real, the real trouble with this is that you can't get out. Darkness can't cast out darkness. Imagine if you had a flashlight that light didn't come out of, darkness came out of it. Darkness. So if there's light around, you shine it and it sucks up the light. If it's dark and you turn that light on, what happens? It doesn't get any lighter. Darkness cannot cast out darkness. We need something from outside of us to come in. And actually the Greeks, the Greeks largely um, kind, of, kind of were muddy here, but they knew this. And what they believed is that you could go over here and find your solution. If you just got into this enough, you could actually solve the problems. The biblical worldview is the opposite. It says darkness cannot cast out darkness. What you actually need, John says, is you need this to come over here and over here. You actually need to be saved from the outside. See, for them, knowledge, logos, is largely passive. It's something you have to go out and grab. But for John, logos is active, dynamic, divine even. And this right here comes crashing in, comes crashing into the darkness. The light shines in the darkness. It says the darkness has not overcome it. That's Christmas in John. We can't save ourselves. It's like back to the War of the Worlds. Uh, I, I don't want to ruin the movie. But just so you know, the human beings in that movie gather all their military, all their strength, their tanks, their guns, their jets, their helicopters, everything, and they, they boom hell, you know. <laughs> and they all get blown up and they do absolutely nothing. Do absolutely nothing to the alien invaders. But the humans survive because salvation comes outside of them. They don't save themselves. Salvation comes from the outside, and this is exactly what John is saying. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, we just sang. I love that song. I'm so glad you guys picked that. That is my favorite Christ, uh, Christmas hymn. And I was having a bit of an ab reaction just as we were singing it. Uh, oh, holy night. Do you see why this is a holy night? Why this is the night divine? Because finally, light 
is coming in and penetrating the darkness. Salvation is coming from the outside. At the end of John's, at the end of John's gospel here in chapter 20, it says that Mary went to the tomb while it was still dark. And she found the tomb empty. Jesus came into the darkness and accomplished a work while it was still dark. He was raised from the dead in the midst of the darkness. Right in the midst of it. You know what that means for us? It's our destiny. The darkness hasn't disappeared. But there will be salvation from it. It's coming. It's coming. That's what his first coming is all about. He's coming again. Salvation will be ours. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Just really quick, um, before I, you know, that's a good note to end on, but I'm just going to go ahead and ruin it. <laughs> you might, uh, here are some questions for you. Do you recognize that we are still in a dark world? Do you recognize the darkness out there? Do you recognize the darkness in here? Are you tired of it? Are you tired of living in the dark? Are you tired of having the dark in you? Or are you playing patty cake with it? Are you tolerating it? Welcoming it? Giving it, you know, its own fair shake? If you've tried to get rid of it yourself, you might have learned that it doesn't actually work like that. You need salvation from the outside. So what can we do? That's the big, that's the big uh, question. So what do we do? Well, you have to receive. You have to receive it. And some of us, even though we receive the Lord at some point, we go, okay, now I'm yours. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> You can only, uh, we are limited. We are limited. You can only pour out of a cup what's been poured into it. This is something that we don't just receive once in a lifetime or once a year. We're constantly in need of receiving the salvation of the Lord Jesus. Paul says, God himself pours his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That is something that is ongoing, ongoing. So, if this is something you're struggling with, I encourage you to receive. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. And if this is the first time you're hearing this, and you don't, this is all new to you, the darkness that you've been carrying with you your whole life, Light is penetrating that. Jesus is right now, right in front of you. Will you receive that light? Will you receive Jesus? Regardless of where you are, that is the charge. Will you receive Jesus 